So good morning, everyone. My name is Jamie Schaefer, and I'm a senior manager on Ducker Frontiers, America's client services team. Before we begin, uh, since some of you might be new to Ducker Frontier, I wanted to take two minutes for a very quick overview of our company and who we are. Uh, so Ducker Frontier uh, is a leading information services and advisory firm for international executives. We have tailored solutions to drive growth for clients across the B2B, healthcare, consumer, and technology sectors. Our dedicated team serves as advisors to our clients by delivering the market and industry knowledge they need to, su to succeed at different points in their business cycle. So our ongoing research paired with custom solutions and our transaction support services provide clients with timely and actionable insights so they can adapt and win in evolving markets, especially given all the COVID uncertainty and volatility plaguing our international markets today. Our company is headquartered in Washington, D.C., with offices across EMEA and Asia Pacific. Uh, we do actually have a new Frontier View mobile app where all of our market intelligence and news and insights live. You can access market content, daily curated news, analyst bites, research reports, receive notifications or personalized daily briefings in the morning, and share content across your teams. You can access it on both the Apple Store and on the Google Play Store. So joining me today is our practice leader for Latin America research um, across Mexico and Brazil, Alejandro Valerio, is going to be leading you through the discussion today. Um, Alejandro is now going to provide a brief overview of our agenda for the discussion this morning. Alejandro? Yep, thank you, Jamie. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Alejandro Valerio. I'm the associate practice leader for Mexico and Central America. It's a pleasure to talk to you this morning, and we hope you and your relatives are sound and safe. Uh, the agenda that we have prepared for you today is actually quite straightforward. We're going to be making the first uh, the first part uh, recap about how is Mexico handling the COVID-19 and the economic recovery reopening. Uh, secondly, I'm going to be talking about what is actually the impact of COVID-19 at this moment in Mexico. Um, thirdly, I'm going to be talking about uh, what is AMLO aiming? I mean, what's his uh, plan to actually rescue the economy? Then I'm going to be walking you through about the impact on the industry trends and some consumer spending outlook. And finally, I'm going to bring that home in terms of actually what that means for businesses and what actions to take uh, business can make and can take at this point uh, since this situation will actually uh, be here with us probably until the end of 2021. Um, well, uh, as we uh, move into the next part of the presentation, um, let's, we want to talk about how Mexico has responded to the COVID crisis since mid-March. Um, so can you walk us through when businesses should potentially expect to see an economic reopening, Alejandro? <laughs> Sure, that, that's a really good question, Jamie, and it's, it's a good way to kick uh, start uh, our conversation. So uh, everyone know that since mid-March and early April, actually Mexico went into a lockdown. So social distancing measures were taken and, and still uh, the country actually has been dealing with the sprawling pandemic across the board. Even though uh, under Secretary of Health, Hugo lopez Gatel, who has become actually to control the pandemic, say that in, oh, in May 17, that actually the pandemic was heading under control or uh, in the common argot now, like flattening the curve. That's not actually the case. Um, as we speak, Mexico has around 570,000 cases and a death toll of, of around 62,000 deaths, which making actually the third country on that bucket in terms of actually death uh, since the first death was recorded uh, by the end of February. Moving forward, the consequence of actually of the having the situation not under control, it's actually uh, when the economy is going to be uh, reopening. And by that we mean actually uh, at the national level and at the so national level. And President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador announced a traffic light system, which basically uh, it's compounded of two elements. On the first hand, uh, it's actually about uh, how many cases have been registered uh, every two weeks, and if actually the curve is being flattening, 
And on the second uh, um, bucket, it's about uh, when the state can open and what you can see here in the traffic light system, if uh, it is in red, only uh, the essential economic activities could be open. Uh, if it's in orange, it would be only essential activities plus non-essential activities with only 30% of labor force. By essential economic activities was actually what the president declared uh, at the end of May or early June. Um, we're talking about mining, manufacturing, um, some retail, sales, but not all the economic activities. And then the third uh, line is what you see in yellow. Uh, with that means actually all activities coupled with the reopening of open public space. And green would be basically that the country is back in normal, including actually having all the schools open. When you see this map, you can tell that only Campeche, uh, it's the only state at this point that has all the activities coupled with some open space open. And then we have six states that are still uh, only about essential economic activities and then we have uh, most of the territory still uh, by essential activities and then actually non-essential uh, with 30% of labor force. By that, what it means uh, in terms of uh, the pandemic is actually that the country is still not having on the control on one hand. And then on the other hand, that Mexico still have a bumpy road to be, let's say like uh, what we have now in Europe or in countries that have been able to put the pandemic on the control, like Singapore or, um, South Korea. Yeah, it looks like a lot of states are still struggling to manage the pandemic, as you mentioned, Alejandro, which will undoubtedly have an economic impact. Can you walk our participants through COVID-19's impact to the economy, what our scenarios for growth are, and when we should expect to see a recovery? Sure, Jamie. I think, uh, you know, that's actually been on the headlines now just recently. Uh, Mexico actually is heading uh, probably to the worst construction since 1932. When you see actually here in this graph, uh, it's actually Q2 was probably the worst, re worst recorded in history. Uh, it was actually a contraction of around 18.9% um, uh, year on year, which actually make it worse than the tequila crisis, what you see here in 1995, and then also uh, the Great Recession and the flu, uh, swine in 2009. Quarter on quarter two, the situation uh, was recorded here. Uh, the first year of Lopez Obrador was actually quite weak, so that actually signaled that the economy entered the pandemic in a really weak state. What you see next, in the next slide, is when the economy is actually going to recover, and, and that's a key question to answer. So first of all, the worst already has happened, which that means actually in Q2. We already start seeing good signal in Q3 and the economy is gonna start uh, bouncing back, but it's gonna be quite slow. And first of all, Mexico is heading to a contraction of around 9.5% in 2020. And what you see in 2021, 5.2, it's gonna be more an statistical carryover. And by that, I mean is what you see in the next slide, it's that the economy is not going to be back to pre-COVID-19 level up until 2024. So Mexico coupled with Argentina would be uh, the two top Latin markets that are going to uh, be regaining uh, 2019 levels at the end uh, or in the mid of this decade in 2025. That actually is important if we think about the depth of the contraction in 2020. And then also what is really important what the government is doing and what is not doing. And what you see here in the next slide, it's actually that the President Lopez Obrador, uh, he has been um, quite straightforward in terms of actually not helping the economy. I mean, Mexico put a fiscal package of only 1% of GDP. That's actually quite pale if we compare with other countries in the region that have been suffering more structural problems, like you can see here in the case of Argentina, which is actually around 4.8% of fiscal package that the Fernandez administration has put forward, despite all the problems that Argentina has been facing. And if we take actually the global benchmark on this from, which is actually the case of Germany, that has put forward a fiscal package of 20, 24.8% of GDP, 
Mexico is way behind on that aspect. And what is the consequence of this response of President Lopez Obrador? And this is what you see here in the next slide. Uh, the lack of a strong fiscal response is already causing structural damage to the Mexican economy. By some estimation stated by NEHI or by the EMSS, Instituto Mexicano de Seguro Social, probably Mexico lost around nine to 10 million jobs in the informal sector, and then for sure around 1.1 million jobs in the formal sector. That actually is going to cause structural damage in the economy in terms of actually the labor market is going to take a while to recover. And the main reason is the fact that President Lopez Obrador has refused to put forward a fiscal aid package to help to pay companies with the payroll and then also to help uh, companies to cope uh, the deep contraction that the economy suffered in Q2. For example, uh, probably more than 10,000 businesses have shut down since mid-March when the economy went in full lockdown. All in all, what you see in the next slide, it's actually uh, our growth scenario for Mexico. And I wanna point the attention to you guys uh, in the middle. And that's actually our base case scenario, or most likely a scenario, which as I pointed out a few slides ago, uh, Mexico is expected to recover in 2024. By that, I mean that when we take in account the two key variables that actually governments can, um, they need to pay attention to put the pandemic under control and then also to deal with the economic fallout. Mexico actually, uh, it's lagging behind in both. First, in terms of virus contain containment, like I pointed out, Mexico is heading to have maybe 600,000 cases uh, in the next weeks on one hand. And then in terms of economic stimulus, uh, as you saw before, 1% of GDP, despite the government has more fiscal room to actually put forward, uh, is clearly insufficient and it's not gonna be helping the economy moving forward. We do expect in actually the treatment and vaccine are gonna be available by the last quarter of 2021. So the current situation is gonna be standing for the next year and a half. And then uh, something that is really important when we talk about actually the drivers uh, that is going to be helping the economy uh, in the next quarters and in 2021 for sure, the most important is the U-shaped recovery in the U.S. And, and that's actually something that we're going to be talking in a moment. But another key issue that we need to pay attention in terms of the oil prices. Oil prices are going to remain weak. And that's actually really important because that's uh, the key economic policy that President Lopez Obrador uh, is betting to revamp the energy sector. And as we will see, uh, it's actually not a uh, smart policy at this point. And then when we think about internal drivers, you know, like most of our clients already are aware since December of last year, we were forecasting that payments were going to lose uh, its investment rate, which it happened now in March, uh, early April. And then uh, we're going to be seeing more uh, in terms of the political front, which is actually going to lead to more political polarization, particularly if we spend, as we expecting, that Morena will lose the control of the Chamber of Deputies. Then another point that I wanna make here, it's uh, we heard recently uh, by Gerardo Esquivel, uh, the undersecretary of Bansico, one of the sub governor that say that probably the, the economy is gonna contract by um, seven, 8% this year, but it's gonna recover the pre-19 level by 2022. Um, unfortunately, that's not, I think that boat already shipped. What you can see here to your right, that would have been the best likely scenario uh, if the economy actually contracted by around 4%. So all in all, before things get better, probably they get worse. Although we're still confident that uh, in light of the current situation and the trends that we have seen that already taking off in Q3, most likely the economy is gonna contract by 9.5%, and then we're gonna be start seeing uh, a statistical carryover in 2021, and normalization of GDP around 2.1 in 2022, and then 2.8 in 2024. So moving forward, another point that is important to bear in mind, it's about the current situation, about the FX, and what we should be expecting moving forward for the rest of the Seteni of Lopez Obrador. So, the first thing, it's actually that the peso, even though that has depreciated by 16% from January to um, April, then it has been resilient since May, when basically all the emerging markets, they took a beating 
uh, because of all the volatility and all the uncertainty. And it has remained resilient uh, around 22.1 and 29 and 21.9 um, since May until basically now the end of August. All in all, uh, we should be expecting that on average, uh, the peso would be between 22 and 30. And the reason actually is what you see in the next slide. When we consider uh, all the factors that are affecting uh, the FX in Mexico, the most important to bear in mind, and not talking only about the COVID-19, but actually moving forward, it's actually the RATI energy policy by Lopez Obrador. I think that's the biggest risk uh, for the peso and for Mexico currency, because when you see in this balance, all the factors that are affecting uh, the currency, the positive actually right now outweigh the negative. We have U.S. last monetary policy on one hand, uh, the U.S. economic recovery that is already happening, uh, the state implementation of the U.S. NCA, which is actually positive news for Mexico exports, and then also with the most important bilateral relationship with uh, that the country has, which is with the U.S. And uh, something that is really important too as well uh, has to do when we think about the strain of Vancico, uh, Mexico uh, uh, um, foreign reserve actually are quite resilient. We're talking about that as today, it's $194 billion. That actually is maybe last for five to six months or um, imports. And that's good news for the peso. So that's when I talk to people, when I talk to clients and what I say to firms, uh, even though we saw some volatility, when we think about the fundamentals of the FX and of the economy as a, as a whole, and macro fundamentals in particular, the peso actually should stay resilient. And, but I will put a caveat here and pay attention particularly to the energy policy of Lopez Obrador because that's the biggest risk when we think about the midterm and the long term. And moving forward in terms of actually the, the effects and then also about other macro uh, fundamentals that we need to pay attention has to do in terms of the inflation and how actually the relationship between inflation and FX play out between now until 2021. And um, basically what you see here is that actually firms, they will have to wait until 2021 to pass the FX uh, on two prices. And that has to do uh, because we're gonna see that uh, more uh, uh, depreciation in terms of FX rather than actually uh, an inflation uh, hike. Inflation, although it has been hiking in the last uh, two months, uh, most likely is going to be ending within Bansico target, which is actually 3% uh, plus minus one. And um, we have seen an uptick in terms of food prices and then and gas. But uh, actually, when we think about the fundamentals of the FX, and then also the fact that demand is still going to be weak in Q3 and Q4, uh, inflation should actually be receding, and then it's going to be actually ending below the FX at depreciation rate this year. Moving forward, we're going to take a moment for uh, for you guys to take the polls. Most likely, the polling results are not actually um, showing up here in the screen, but um, we recording your results. And one thing that I can tell you about this question, which is, are you planning to adjust your pricing or collection process to alleviate the FX burden borne by your customer distributors in Mexico? What we've been hearing with clients, uh, it's basically what we just presented in the previous slides, that most of the firms are absorbing the cost at this moment uh, because uh, customers are going to be more price sensitive in light of the current situation and what we see that uh, in the market at this point. Alejandro, a quick question on that. Is it going to be industry specific on uh, cost absorption across firms? Can you say that again, James? Will it be will it be industry specific for cost absorption? Will it be some industries absorbing the cost over others instead uh, of passing them along to customers? I think overall, they actually it goes uh, um, more on the B2B from than on the B2C. Okay. Well, given the strong economic impacts by COVID, and since AMLO is, is not really organizing a strong fiscal package to help with the economic and the private sector, 
what are AMLO's policies been so far, and what is his policy moving forward to rescue the economy? Thank you, Jamie. That actually is like what the one million dollar question. Um, what you can see here, uh, AMLO is banking on the U.S. to leave the economy, Mexico economy. Um, this is something really important. We try to cut the noise from policy speeches, uh, pundits. Um, we developed this core card of AMLO and Trump relationship. And what you can see here, that despite all the rhetoric, uh, both men have been able to work well. Um, Lopez Obrador, he has been able to handle uh, the U.S.-Mexico relations quite savvy. Um, this is something really important. When we think about what are actually going to be the key drivers uh, of recovering uh, in Mexico, that in one hand is actually the export uh, sector and the manufacturing sector in particular. And then on the other hand, when we think about uh, consumer spending fundamentals, remittances become really important. And you can see here in this table that remittances flows, they actually have been increasing in the last four to five years. And this year, they have remained quite resilient and most likely are going to become more than 3% of GDP. Just to give you uh, one note, um, in 2019, uh, remittances actually, they were more than the FDI, as you can see here, 36 billion versus 33 billion. And that's why it's so important for AMLO to keep this relationship healthy uh, with Trump and with the US in particular. And that's the main bet that he's doing with the economy. So first should not be spending a fiscal package, but they should be spending that AMLO handling well uh, the US relationship. But you can see here in the next slide, that um, that bet actually comes with some risk. Uh, at this moment in the U.S., uh, the situation in terms of the pandemic, what you can see to your right, uh, is not under control. Uh, the U.S. economy is still going through a really bumpy reopening that will affect the output of remittances, particularly when you, when you think about where the large Mexican communities are based uh, in the southwestern states and states like Texas for example, that are still dealing with a significant amount of COVID-19 cases, or even the case of California that uh, at the beginning was went through a major lockdown, then started the process to reopening gradually in June and July, but it has to roll back that process when we have seen that another spike of COVID-19 cases. And another thing is actually the fact about the uh, unemployment rate, particularly in the U.S., when we think about that, uh, even though we have seen some gains uh, in the U.S. labor mar market uh, in June and July, um, we should have been expecting like unemployment to go below double digits in 2020. So that's something to pay attention. That's why there is some risk with Anlo's bet uh, in terms of lifting Mexican economy. Another question that it comes when you see in the next slide, it's actually how uh, uh, the U.S. electoral cycle is going to affect U.S.-Mexico relationship, and that's actually really important. Um, at this moment, we do have Biden winning the U.S. election, uh, even though we expect that it's going to be close. Uh, Biden is uh, uh, supposed to edge Trump in the electoral college, um, and thereby we might be dealing with the Biden presidency uh, in 2021. But the key point here that I want you to uh, bear in mind is what you see on the left, this table. Uh, in terms of actually what are the key structural issues of the U.S.-Mexico relations on one hand, and then also uh, in terms of actually how they might be fair, uh, either if it's Trump or Biden, at the head of the U.S. Uh, economy. So if we think about a Trump uh, second term, that might be beneficial when we think about the energy and then in the U.S. NCA, uh, because you know, the biggest risk for the USMCA or for the NAFTA uh, would have been the shutdown or the elimination of the treaty, what Trump pledged in 2016. And that risk is actually now off the table. But when we think about Biden presidency, pre um, candidate Bi Biden already pledged to actually tilt more to the renewal side, which actually would put some uh, pressure on the energy, um, on the fossil fuel uh, component of the energy field worldwide which is actually the part that uh, President Lopez Obrador is banking the most in the domestic front in terms of actually pumping resources for payments. And then also when we think about in terms of trade, uh, one component of the USMCA is actually the uh, labor chapter. And that actually means uh, uh, labor supervision to uh, firms, 
based in Mexico, which uh, when we think about in the US domestic politics, how the, for example, the AFL-CIO, uh, a major union in, in the US, they have more sway with the Democrats. So we should be spending more pressure in a Biden administration to comply with the labor covenants uh, enshrined in the USMCA treaty. Um, moving with the USMCA, another point I would like to make, which you can see in the next slide, it's about what kind of factors are going to be impacting uh, firms. Um, this is something firms should be putting in the radar. Um, you know, the USMCA is going to bring changes, particularly when we think about the midterm and the long term. Uh, in July 1st, uh, the treaty became applicable for all, for all to all the parties. And in the case of Mexico, we should be expecting you know, structural reforms by 2023. And, and I want to point out two in particular, like the one you see here uh, in terms of the new rules of origin, uh, when we think about particularly with the auto in industry, which is an industry that represents um, maybe around 180 to 200 billion dollars of exports uh, from Mexico. Uh, in order to benefit from you know, zero tax, tax in imports on the US side, they will have to have components from, they're gonna be increasing the component from 63% to 75%. And another impact that we're gonna see in the auto industry has to do with the increases of wages, uh, which you can see here to your right, uh, Mexico would have to increase uh, the hourly wages from 3.73 the hour to $16.2023. And to put that in perspective, the US uh, hourly uh, wages in the auto sector went from $7 back in 2006 to $23 in 2019. So in a period of 11 years, the US reached that gap. When Mexico has now, uh, in three years, they need to get there. And that's what we're gonna be seeing that some pressure on that sector. In the next slide, uh, not everything actually has to do with the structural change, but actually on the positive front from the USMCA, uh, it's a fact that it's gonna be cementing uh, some key industry and it's gonna be benefiting the manufacturing states. As you can see here on the heat map, this is actually the state that exports the most from 2007 to 2019. And then also on the table, which industry actually were uh, you know, the outliers. So they, did, they performed quite well. So the fact that the USMCA will uh, remain, it will benefit uh, both these states, uh, the manufacturing states, and then also key industries, as you see here, auto exports, machinery, or equipment. And that actually is really important when we think also about labor dynamics in Mexico, that we should be spending a, a, a recovery faster in these states rather than states like Yucatan or Quintana Roo that rely heavily on the tourist industry. And now I would like to talk about uh, the domestic politics of Mexico, which I think is really important in the current juncture when we think about the 2021 outlook. So the first thing is actually when we think about uh, the policy agenda of Orlando and Morena. And you can see here to your left in the blue box uh, that actually Orlando and Morena, they have been quite effective in terms of actually pushing forward their policy agenda. And AMLO that actually won by a landslide in 2018 also gained the control of the Senate and the uh, majority of the lower house of the Chamber of Deputies, which has helped him to move forward his agenda. But I will point out that when we think about now and the 2021 elections, which actually are gonna be held in early July, uh, I, I would point out that we're gonna be seeing that for sure, uh, you know, the reform in terms of pensions, uh, which actually was already an agreement between the Coparmets and AMLO. And then also I would pay attention to a possible um, energy reform or a tax reform, and then also in institutional levels, when we think about the judicial sector or uh, in the electoral uh, realm. And that has to do if we think about if Morena loses the Chamber of Deputies in 2021, they might want to push um, uh, these reforms before the new Congress actually swarm in in September of next year. So keep in your radar what you see on your right. Uh, do not underestimate the capacity of AMLO and Morena to push forward this uh, policy agenda between now and September of 2021. However, 
when we think about, for example, in the next slide, um, how that actually is affecting the operating environment at this point, one thing we, we should be uh, expecting and that actually is that investment is not going to recover in 2020. Uh, and that has to do mainly because of rapid policies. And I'm just going to put that in your radar, for example, in the midst of actually the pandemic starting to hit Mexico. Um, AMLO supported, and Morena supported uh, another flimsy public consultation that actually shut down the famous now Constellation Brands Brewery. That was an investment uh, worth around $1.4 billion that he has already uh, uh, implemented around $900 million. And he was shut down the same way that he was shut down the Naim back in October of 2018. When we think about the domestic uh, headwinds, and then also on the other from what happened with the COVID-19, you can see the trend of investment that actually plunged and is unlikely to recover in 2020. And moving forward, you can see in the business confidence index, that actually was a trend uh, in the first uh, month of this year, and then basically just plunged um, in April and May, and it has plateaued there. And the key idea I want you to bear in mind is actually that this confrontation and this double down coming from the executive branch in Mexico against uh, the private sector, like, for example, rejecting any possibility of fiscal uh, package or uh, what was the whole dispute about perhaps giving more uh, sway to the executive branch in terms of fiscal policy, it's just going to be aggravating uh, the business confidence in that's and particularly affecting the uh, investment moving forward, at least throughout 2020. But uh, when we think about now in more details in terms of actually the nuance of what is the composition of the Congress in the next slide and what we should be expecting, uh, you can see here, uh, this is the current uh, picture or snapshot of uh, Mexico's Congress. And at this point, like I pointed out before, uh, Morena and AMLO, they do have the control. They're going to continue to have the control of the Senate, which is up for renewal in 2024. And it remains to be seen if uh, Morena and his allies will continue to have the absolute majority that they have now in the Chamber of Deputies. I still believe that with the triple crisis that Morena and AMLO have been dealing uh, on one front with the sanitary crisis, with the economic crisis and the social crisis, that is going to be taking a toll on, on Morena's uh, chances in 2021. However, what you see in the next slide is actually that uh, they still have uh, a possibility to perform well despite of the deep economic crisis of this year. And that has to do with the fact that with all this corruption scandal affecting the opposition, um, Morena and Anlo, they will use it as a cudgel or to hammer the opposition and particularly the pre which is actually poised to lose most of the governorship that it controls today. As you can see here in this map, eight out of the 15 governorship uh, states are on the hand of the PRI, which is going to be affected by cases like the Lozoya affair, the Duarte affair, or the Estafa Maestra, like just three of the biggest corruption scandals that are now rocking the Mexico political landscape. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, since you've laid out the current economic and political landscape, can you describe how some industries will be impacted by all of this? Sure. Um, that's a good point, uh, Jamie. I'm, I'm, I'm briefly I'm going to go through through this part. And the first point I want to make, you can see here in this heat map, uh, what we prepare by industries. Uh, on one hand, uh, we should be expecting that IT and telecom industry, they should be doing much better than anyone else. Uh, as I pointed out at the beginning, the new normal that has been created by the COVID-19 is going to last most likely until the end of 2021. Thereby, anyone who wants to work from home or all the companies that they want to stay ahead of the, uh, the curve, they will have to invest on their uh, infrastructure, on the digital infrastructure. Then uh, industries like agriculture pulling by the U.S. demand, they're going to remain resilient. And then also, of course, in terms of the retail, the, the fast moving uh, consumer goods, they're going to be also uh, performing well 
at least uh, throughout 2020, and then they're going to be normalizing to pre-COVID-19 levels when we think about 2021. On the other hand, the tourist industry is the one that is going to be hitting the worst, and at the same time, hospitality and leisure. And in the next slide, you can see this is a good snapshot to, to understand when we think about key industrial sectors of Mexico, that the manufacturing is the one that is going to be recovering faster. And that has to do fully by the U.S. demand and the U.S. recovery, which actually started uh, by May and by June when the economy started to go back online after completely coming to a halt uh, by around 80 percent in April. Um, let me talk to one key industry when you see in the next slide, which is actually the energy sector and oil. Um, first of all, you know, the OPER agreement and then also with the operational uh, problems that payments is dealing is going to be affecting uh, the company moving forward. And, and the most important thing that businesses, they should bear in mind when they think about payments is the fact that the government has pledged to rebound this industry, which is going to be dealing with weak oil prices, and to pump around 144 billion pesos between now and 2022. But you see here uh, in the in the middle uh, uh, of this page in the table that all the trends actually pointed in a in a in a bad direction. Uh, payments have major financial losses uh, in H1. We're talking about around 26 billion dollar which added to the total debt another $2 billion. And you can see here that Pemex, which is the most indebted oil company in the world, uh, it's actually now uh, owing $180 billion in the next 10 years. And oil output, which actually the government was expecting to increase by 1.8 million bottles per day by the end of this year, that's not going to happen. Actually, they have been decreasing. And the latest report actually puts Pemex uh, production around 1.5 million bottles per day, which actually show a trend going down that coupled with weak oil price put payments in a dire situation from moving forward. Mining, which is the next slide, it's another issue which we shouldn't be expecting uh, also a recovery. AMLO pledged in the campaign and something that he has said that uh, um, has been coherent on that from it's the fact that he's not going to be giving any, um, no more concessions to actually uh, ramp up mining production. And when we couple that with the environmental rules and then also the, start, the, the tax rules at the state and the federal levels, and an administration that actually is reluctant to give more concessions and continue the opening of the sector that started in 2015, uh, we shouldn't be expecting an increase of mining output despite that uh, commodities prices have been bouncing back since mid-June. But the good news for Mexico is what you see in the next slide. When we think about the auto industry, which after taking a major nosedive in Q2 and plunging to record level in May, uh, contracting by 95% year on year, it definitely bounced back in June. And, and that's actually good news for Mexico when we think about the alignment in terms of supply chain uh, with the U.S. and then also with Canada. And then when we think about the domestic from uh, in terms of actually jobs. I mean, Mexico, uh, the auto industry actually uh, has between 800 to 800,000 to 1 million direct jobs uh, linked to that industry. So the fact that it went online uh, in June, that AMLO declared that part of the essential activities, that's actually good news for exports, it's good news for the FX, and it's good news for the country. The same thing like you see in the next slide, which is actually about machinery and equipment, that even though that it decreased um, substantially in Q2, we should be expecting a recovery uh, now in Q3, and it's going to be helping uh, the export basket of Mexico. Uh, you can see here in the graph that it was the first group of items that actually recovered when the U.S. bounced back in 2010 after the Great Recession in 2009. And we should be expecting the same thing uh, as the U.S. demand actually improved. Moving forward, the construction sector that has actually linked what you saw before in terms of a decline of gross fixed investment. Um, it's a sector that is really important for the economy, but it's definitely it's not going to be recovering this year. Uh, on one hand, uh, we're going to continue to see the uncertainty on the private sector to uh, restrain the investment on 
on construction. And then on the other hand, you know, the government spending plans uh, and programs or, you know, projects such as the Maya train, um, oil refineries, those are contingent to where we see that, uh, you know, the control of the pandemic. As you saw that uh, most of the state in Mexico, they're still struggling to completely reopening, thereby it's going to be stalling uh, the, the improvement of construction output when we think about at least for 2020. And then uh, just to wrap it up about the industry trends, when we think about agriculture, agriculture are going to continue in a positive trend. Um, and that's actually really important. First of all, they increase around 10% year on year in Q1. And um, you can see here in this trend, there has been actually quite healthy growth uh, in 2019, driven by the demand of Mexico agricultural products of the US. And as everybody, I mean, this has become an essential item uh, now uh, in the midst of the pandemic, we should be expecting that the agriculture sector to remain resilient in 2020, 2021, and moving forward. And uh, in the next slide, moving forward, when we think about the wholesale and retail sales, uh, that's something also that is going to be remaining weak uh, in Mexico. Uh, they plunge in May. Uh, they actually recover uh, in June of this year. Uh, but uh, we need to put this in perspective that uh, the slow recovery might be actually fill uh, with a bumpy row ahead, uh, depending where we are in terms of the control of the pandemic. Uh, as Mexico is will be facing these issues of uh, uh, a reopening that is not going to be completely uniform across the board in the country, uh, we should be expecting, like, for example, retail sales uh, in Mexico City or in the state of Mexico to be much better uh, at the end of this year rather than in Q3. Uh, when we think about uh, how the pandemic is in both states at this point. And to wrap it up, the industry trends uh, in terms of consumer spending, uh, the, the main point I want to make here, uh, uh, Jamie, and to everyone on the line, is actually that consumer spending is not going to recover until 2022. You can see here that uh, it's going to take a, a deep dive in 2020. We spent in a contraction of consumer spending by 9% in 2020 and then a statistical carryover of 6% in 2021, but an abnormalization started in 2022. Uh, the important of this is when we think about all the drivers that affect consumer spending, uh, they all point in a negative direction with the exception of government transfer and remittances. The remittances case I already made, um, and that actually is linked to what's happening in the US and the fact that we're expecting a recovery here and then also the passage of another uh, uh, relief bill that is going to be helping the, the remittance flows going to Mexico. And then government transfer that has to do with the social programs. And regardless of what uh, is happening in the economy, President Lopez Obrador has pledged and he has continued to invest heavily on the social programs, which is going to be helping the low and middle uh, income segments of the Mexico society. We're talking about around 655 billion pesos that the government make a reshuffle in April. And when we think, uh, when we see the data uh, coming from the federal government execution, in fact, they actually been uh, continuing and they've been investing heavily on programs such as Jóvenes um, Generación Futuro or Sembrando Vida. Thanks, Alejandro. So moving into our last section, can you discuss what some of the implica business implications are going to be and what some of our multinational client base can take in terms of actions? Sure, uh, Jamie. And before we open up for a question from, from the audience. Um, so here, uh, this is a table that me and my colleagues, we designed that actually show what companies can do and how they should be thinking about this crisis. And then when we think about Mexico, they should be thinking about different phases. Uh, first of all, 2020 is gonna be a rough year, but Mexico remains attractive when we think about in the midterm and then also in the long term, vis-a-vis -vis is not only Latin, but also vis-a-vis -vis other emerging markets. So companies should be thinking about, first of all, in terms of the short term, make sure that you're protecting your employees, your labor force, and your productivity high. And um, particularly when we think about uh, industries that are uh, not or attached to the supply chain uh, in the uh, northern uh, cluster. And by that, I mean the US and Canada. 
On the other hand, uh, think about how uh, you know we're going to be dealing uh, with this government between now and 2024. So make sure you are fine-tuned at the local level, and then also in terms of headquarters with the government engagement strategy and the playbook that you have to engage and to stay ahead of the curve against any policy disruption. And then when you think about the long term, make sure to have a holistic scenario planning approach and to keep an eye on the ball that make and um, have uh, the flexibility to make the adjustment as the operating environment is going to be quite fluid. Then what you see in the next page, another thing that I want to leave you here with a good positive tone uh, has to do with the COVID-19 actually opens a whole world of opportunities. Uh, on one hand, for example, uh, you know, you can definitely invest in terms of your digital transformation. E-commerce channel is going to become a huge part of firms and firms that actually they want to stay ahead of the curve. And we already start seeing that, for example, in the leisure sector, that when the economy went into a hole, 80 percent of the restaurants, they couldn't actually sell uh, or they couldn't sell to the pre-pandemic levels because they didn't have a digital platform. Only 10 percent have a digital platform that they could sell and they've been able to capture a lot of market share because of that decision to have a, 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 a robust uh, infrastructure in terms of the technology realm. On the other hand, when we think about supply chain dynamics, I mean, companies should be thinking about pushing for localization. The decoupling of the US and China economies actually is on the way and Mexico can gain a lot from there when we think about how attractive the Mexico operating environment looks like with the USMCA uh, near shoring actually your production and making sure that you do have a good platform uh, with zero taxes on the border of your products going from Mexico that actually has a good labor force and cheaper when we think about productivity terms vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and right there at the gates of the largest market in the world, which is actually the US. And also, when we think about value proposition, make sure to actually uh, to revamp and to have uh, your value proposition updated to the new terms and to make sure that the customer journey uh, in the post pandemic world looks more pleasant than it is right now. Because what we see that now, maybe it's behavioral changes that might stay for a while that you will need to uh, for all the companies to adapt their value proposition. And likewise, when we think about the organizational footprint, uh, the rethinking of the office space has become crucial. And by that, I mean that companies might actually have to reshuffle their office space uh, forever. Um, for example, if you have a place that you have a workforce uh, established, you might actually just have the workforce at home and then only use the office for meetings and for meetings with clients or special events. And that's something that companies already start rethinking and it can help you in terms of operating costs and to make your workforce also more productive. So moving forward, I think I'm gonna leave this poll. Um, we're gonna be recording the results, but we would like to hear from you. Um, please send us your question. And we will take a few now before we wrap it up. So Alejandro, it looks like one question came in. Um, yeah. The question is how will AMLO's strategy be? Um, how will it adapt accordingly with the result of a Biden election throughout the remainder of AMLO sexennial? That, that's a great question. Um, and this is one thing uh, I think about it. Uh, on one hand, um, AMLO, uh, he has been quite savvy in terms of dealing with Trump. And um, although he has taken a lot of heat, I think if he has handled the economy the way he handles the US-Mexico relations, uh, maybe we should be talking about different outlook. Uh, when we think about Biden, what we might happen is the fact that Biden might go back to the traditional Republican and Democrat approach. And that means actually uh, decoupling uh, issues such as immigration, national security, and uh, trade. That was not the case with Trump. Trump put everybody, everything in the same bucket. 
For example, um, it put uh, the fact like last year, the immigration flow didn't decrease. Uh, it's going to tax Mexico export from 5 to 25% and basically plunge the FX by 3 to 5% in only four or five days. We shouldn't be seeing that with a Biden presidency. Um, Biden wouldn't be putting that type of pressure, at least not in the open on one hand. And then on the other hand, uh, Biden might be more vocal uh, in terms of uh, when we think about uh, the energy realm. I mean, Biden has to make a, con uh, a concession uh, with the more left winning side of the Democratic Party with the Green New Deal. So Biden, and he has pledged to join the party's accord again, so Biden might be more vocal in terms of the use of fossil fuel, which might collapse with Anlo's agenda of revamping payments and revamping the fossil fuel industry in Mexico, which is a cornerstone of the economic policy of Mexico at this point. So when we see that, when we think about Biden presidency, we should be thinking about going back to the, uh, you know, the all, uh, typical U.S.-Mexico relations of dealing with immigration security separately from the trade side. And then on the other hand, with the Biden presidency, he's going to be putting more pressure on issues like energy or maybe the labor uh, uh, covenants enshrined in the U.S. NCA. So AMLO will have to uh, deal with that and probably will have to push back in terms of the pressure that he might receive uh, from the businesses, uh, particularly when the Copa Nets which actually were not quite happy uh, with the results in terms of the negotiation of the labor chapter of the USMCA. One uh, quick question that we got here, um, and then with this one, we can wrap it up. It is that if, should we spend thing, um, more uh, political polarization after the election of next year and how that's going to affect the operating environment? Uh, absolutely. Uh, the elections, I mean, this sounds cliche, but the states could not be high. Uh, for AMLO, that means actually the rest of the Setenio and how actually they, he positioned himself and he positions Morena moving forward. We need to think about Anlo Morena in many ways uh, in historical lens. Uh, he might like to put and try to do what Plutarco Elias Calles did with the PRI, which actually would be established, uh, you know, the ruling party for a while. And in order to do that, he needs to have the control uh, in terms of the policy agenda, not only on the media front, like he does every morning, but actually doing that in terms of execution. And for that, the Congress is essential. On the other hand, we might see that more polarizations as the opposition, if they regain the control of the Chamber of Deputies, they will push back with some of the agenda and some of the policy that Anglo Morena will try to push forward without compromising, particularly coming from the Morena and Anglo side. So let's see what's going to happen next year. But first, should be expecting more political polarization moving forward after the 2021 election. Jamie? Well, thank you, Alejandro. Um, everyone on the line, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we've run out of time, but we can answer additional follow-up questions uh, if you've left them in the, uh, in the chat box. Um, we will be sending across the presentation, the recording of the webinar today, um, and we do apologize for the technical difficulties we had with the polling. But the polling figures that we did um, that we did register will be included in the presentation that we that we send out. I hope you have a great rest of your week and a great weekend, and I wish you and your family stay safe during this heightened pandemic. Take care. Bye.